Hi students, uh, I thought I'd deal with the muddiest point here in a slightly different way this week. Uh, I thought what I would do instead is just sort of record a quick video here where I answer some of the key questions. Um, one person asked how lava is formed. Um, we've discussed how lava is formed several different times, but uh, basically it's from the, the melting or partial melting of pre-existing rocks. Um, and if you want to melt a rock, you basically have three options. Take a cold rock and make it hot. Take a hot rock that's under lots of pressure and release the pressure, or take a hot rock that's under lots of pressure and add water to it, all right? So um, while we live up here on the cold, low pressure surface of the earth, uh, it seems like the most obvious way to get something to melt is to add heat to it, but you can also get rocks to melt in other ways if they're deep in the earth and under lots of pressure. And one of those is to release the pressure, usually by causing the rock to rise up to a shallower depth in, in the uh, mantle or in the crust, uh, or basically add some water, and the water lowers the melting temperature of lots of different minerals, and the rocks are made out of minerals. Um, another person asked how decompression melting works, so we just covered that. Basically, it's the rock moving up to a shallower depth in the mantle. Um, I had a couple questions about uh, the relationship between viscosity and explosivity of volcanoes. What causes volcanoes to have giant explosions versus subtle ones? Why is some lava of higher viscosity than others? Um, basically, the most explosive volcanic eruptions uh, form when you have really viscous magma, magma that resists flowing, all right? And magma will resist flowing if it is rich in silica, all right? So felsic magmas tend to be much more viscous than uh, mafic magmas. Um, the little silica tetrahedra link up in long sort of strings, and those long strings uh, in, in the magma resist flowing. You know, they basically get tangled up. So if you get a bunch of those things all together, it all gets tangled up, and you end up getting uh, very little flow. Um, on the other hand, in mafic lavas, uh, they tend to have very low levels of silica by comparison. And uh, those low levels of silica um, basically mean you have less of those little tangles in the uh, lava at the molecular level. Um, under what con conditions do volcanoes emerge? Um, that goes along with this one, the six types of volcanoes. Well, we didn't say there were six types of volcanoes. We said there were three types of volcanoes, all right? And those were stratovolcanoes, also known as composite volcanoes, cinder cones, and then shield volcanoes. Um, but what this person, I think, is referring to is the six different plate tectonic settings or scenarios that would give rise to volcanism. And a quick review of those. Um, one is where you have two plates coming together and you have oceanic lithosphere subducting underneath other oceanic lithosphere. That gives you a volcanic island arc. Option number two is a convergent plate boundary where you have uh, oceanic lithosphere subducted underneath continental lithosphere. That gives you a continental volcanic arc. Option number three is a divergent plate boundary where you have oceanic uh, lithosphere separating from other oceanic lithosphere. Option number four, also divergent, but in this case it's a rift valley, continental lithosphere separating from other continental lithosphere. Option number five is basically where you just have a hot spot and it pierces up through oceanic lithosphere. And option number six, hot spot piercing up through continental lithosphere. Okay, so those are the six situations. Basically there's three convergent, divergent, and hotspot, but those can occur with different combinations of oceanic and continental lithosphere. All right, what else have we got here? Um, can a hotspot be extinguished? Yeah, it can. If it runs out of material or if it cools off, then the hotspot will stop rising. Yes. Uh, columnar jointing, why does it fracture that way? Is it due to the lava's composition? Has nothing to do with the lava's composition. Has everything to do with the lava cooling off over time and then the strength of the rock. If the rock is relatively weak, and as it cools off, it takes up less volume and contracts a bit, then it will cause these cracks to develop. And those cracks basically form at the top of the lava flow, and then they propagate downward through the entire lava flow. They have that particular shape, basically because the, as the rock contracts, there are equally spaced centers of contraction. And so basically the rock is contracting in every direction all at the same time. Um, think about a mud puddle drying up. The mud puddle loses uh, volume as well because water is evaporating out of the mud, and uh, it basically takes on that same pattern. A series of polygon-shaped cracks develop at the top, and then those cracks go deeper down into the mud puddle as it dries up. 
A uh, couple questions about uh, blocks and bombs. When blocks are extruded, are the blocks made out of older rock in the magma? Um, they are made out of older rock, but usually it's older rock that was there at the volcano before the eruption uh, happened. So, for instance, uh, a million years ago, the volcano erupts, it oozes out some lava, that lava cools, you've got solid rock. Then, today, that volcano erupts again, and it takes that million-year-old rock and basically explodes it out in all directions. Like a bomb going off in a building, it would blow out pieces of the, the building in all directions, but it's not like the bomb made the building. The building was there before the bomb. Um, another person asked, can uh, pyroclastic bombs explode on impact? Well, they are not really bombs in the sense of like, you know, an explosive device, all right? They're just basically droplets of magma that develop a crust as they fly through the air. Um, usually when they land, they retain that crust-like shape. They look like a loaf of bread. I suppose it's possible that in some cases they land like a paintball and the crust cracks and then the interior lava splatters out. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, but I don't think that's very common. Lastly, a person asked, if you slip and fall on magma, would you die? If your hand or foot uh, what got put on magma, would it disappear? First off, if it's magma, you can't touch it because magma is underground. If you can touch it and it's molten rock, it's lava. All right. Um, would you die? Well, it depends on how bad the uh, resulting burn would be. Uh, your hand or foot would not disappear. Uh, uh, it would, uh, it's made out of matter and it would react with the, uh, the, the conditions around it, uh, the material around it, um, driven by the heat. So those chemical reactions basically are going to be facilitated by all the heat that the lava is giving off. So um, your hand would probably end up um, getting extraordinarily burned. The water would be driven off of your hand. And once your hand is free of water, then it would catch on fire and burn, just like a log uh, from a tree or something like that. Um, so uh, your hand wouldn't melt. You're not made out of meltable material, but you are made out of burnable material. So that's a nice cheery question to end the session on. I hope this was useful for you and uh, look forward to chatting with you about sedimentary rocks and, and where we get sediments uh, tomorrow in lecture. Thanks a lot. Bye.